Welcome to another cat pat tip where we are going to give you five tips that you can use to help you with your phase two questionnaire. Hopefully by now you've finished your phase one and the start of the phase two involves creating a questionnaire where you're going to get some information and so these five tips are going to help you make sure that you get the most out of that questionnaire because that sets up the next two parts which is the spreadsheet and the database. So we need to make sure that we get the questionnaire done correctly. So let's get into cat pat tip number one, which is you first need to create your survey in Word. I would plan it in Word, make sure that you get the layout and the wording all correctly. So use that first. If you look at the instructions, it actually says there that even if you do this questionnaire online via online forms, you still need to have evidence of your questionnaire done in Word. You first need to create it in Word, get the questions right, get the planning and the layout and all that correctly. So you will be using a word processor to do that. But once that's done, you can then use that word processor to either create a PDF or a Word document that they can fill in and email it. Or you could physically print your survey and give out physical copies for people to fill in. Or you can create an online version using, for example, Google Forms. But the first thing is you must create it in Word, plan it, make sure it's exactly how you want it, because this is what you are going to store in your questionnaire folder that's in your phase two folder. Just a reminder, if you are using Word, you must go to the developer tab. And then if you see there under the developer tab, you see those controls. You want to click on that little drop down over there and you want to access the legacy form controls. Those are the ones that are the nicest to, to use. So if you are going to use a Word document which allows users to edit a particular form, then I would really recommend using those legacy form tools under the developer tab. If you need some more revision or help about how to create a form using Microsoft Word and these legacy form tools, then I have a video on forms. The link will be in the description, but make sure that you watch it so you know how to set up your Word document so that people can use it to enter in information as if it was a live form. If you are going to give it to people online, then I would recommend using, for example, a Google form. I have a whole series of videos about how to create your Google form, how to set up the settings so that you can be ready to get responses and then how to eventually get those responses. These are on my teacher tips channel. If you go into YouTube and search for Atmos Long Teacher Tips and you look for the Google playlist, you'll find it there. But if you've got the pat guide, which you can download at tinyurl.com slash mrlongpatguardcat, there are links there to these videos as well as the forms one that we mentioned earlier. Check the video description or get the pat guide and you'll have links to all these videos. Then cat pat tip number two, there are certain questions which I do not recommend asking and these are some of them. So please don't ask the following questions. Don't ask for name and surname. You're not going to do any statistics on it. You're not going to need it for any data. People tend to not like forms where they are giving their personal details, particularly their name and surname. They like to be anonymous. They're more likely to be honest if they are anonymous. So there's no real point to asking for their name and surname. Then don't ask for their age. You might want that for the statistical analysis, but in our next tip, I'll tell you what is a better option for that. Age is not a good thing to ask for. We want to tick the blocks for our spreadsheet, so we'll talk about that in the next tip. I highly recommend that you don't ask for age because you don't know when that age is going to change. If that person is still going to be a particular age when you do your analysis. And then don't ask data that is common for most respondents. For example, if you're going to ask for grade, if you're asking students and you know that you're probably only going to give the survey to grade 12s, then you're going to just have a bunch of records where everyone's in grade 12 and that data is useless to you. You want information that has a variety to it. Even if it's only one or two grade 11 students, that's not going to be very valuable to you. You want a variety of data. So don't look for common things. For example, gender might be a good one if you're going to use it for your analysis. But if you're going to predominantly ask one particular gender over another, then that data is going to be a bit skewed. If you want to get analysis from people in the province, but you're only going to be targeting people that you know that are live in your province, that's not going to be very really useful for you. So don't ask for data that's common for everyone. And then don't ask questions about general facts. This is not a quiz. You're not quizzing the people doing the survey. You're not expecting them to know what the average usage time of people using AI or whatever like that. You are asking for their opinions. Your research from phase one, that will get the stats and the information about the general facts about those topics. With the survey, you are looking for people's opinions and what their personal experiences are. So don't quiz them on what are the average number of people 
that use AR, you want to ask how much they have used AR, for example, or how much they've interacted with something. So you're asking questions from their experience or their views, not general facts. Then also don't ask for unnecessary information. Don't ask for their address if you're not going to use it. Don't ask for their gender if you're not going to need it. Don't ask for information that you're not necessarily going to use, particularly the biographical data. And by doing this, you'll hopefully not have too many questions. Remember, you are asking a lot of people to fill this form out. You want the form to be able to be filled out as quick as possible. And that means you don't want to have too many questions. If there are too many questions, people aren't going to fill it out. You're going to struggle to get your 25 respondents. Keep it to a couple of questions, getting just the information that you need. So these are the questions that I would tend to avoid. But there are some questions that you can ask, and these are the ones that I encourage. And so ask these types of questions. You are looking for questions that have measurable answers, things that you can do statistics on. For example, questions that have a yes or a no. You can count how many people said yes, you can count how many people said no. You're looking for questions where there is a physical number. For example, how many students you have in your class, how many students do you teach, anything where there's an actual number. Numbers are nice to compare, where you can find the averages of, you can find the max of, you can find the min of. Another option is to use rating scale questions on a scale of one to five. One meaning this, five being this. This is how you can get people's opinions. You can also use a scale from one to four if you want to avoid people taking just the, the number three as the middle option every single time, but have like a scale. But remember when you're using a rating scale, make sure that you indicate what each number means. But this is a nice way where you can find out what number was the most commonly selected number for people's opinions. For example, finding the mode, finding the average. And then also look for options where there are multiple choices. And you can count how many people said this choice, how many people said that choice. This is also nice if you've got a, quite a wide range. For example, if you're asking someone how often they use AR, that might be quite a wide range of numbers. So maybe having a multiple choice saying, I use it maybe once a month as option A, option B being I use it maybe once a week, option C being I use it multiple times a week, option D meaning I use it every single day. That way you can have a variety of choices and you can do stats on which choice was the most popular. Those are really useful types of questions. You also want to have a question where you are choosing from a category. This is particularly important if you are wanting to group your data according to categories. Gender is one that you can use if it is useful for your data, but if it's not, there are other categories. For example, maybe you want to determine what type of role the person is in education. Are they a high school student, a university student, or an educator or lecturer? And then they select from a drop-down list. What you are doing here is you can then do statistics where you can use count ifs where you find what high school students said for this question, what university students said for that question, what educators said for that question. So you can actually use count ifs to break up two criteria and that's really useful to have that category field. Also for your access reports, you can actually group data according to these categories. I wouldn't go more than four groups Try keep it to three or two, that's very useful. The moment you get above four and you've only got 25 respondents, it does become a bit skewed in the data. So try find a nice category question. And then other questions which I suggest is a date field. Now remember I said you mustn't ask age, but you can ask for example their birth date. Or maybe you want to ask a start date when they started a particular career or when they started studying, something along those lines. You want to have a date field because that allows you then to use your date functions in Excel, which ticks a block when we get to the Excel part. Or if we want to do queries on dates in the database. Having a date field available now in our planning allows us to have better options of what we want to do later on in the phase two. Also, don't be afraid of questions where there are multiple options that they can choose from. For example, yeah, you can see that they use checkboxes where you can select more than one option or no options as well. So for example, there you can see I've selected red and blue at the same time. What's nice about these questions is that you can now use your count if with wildcards, trying to find out if the word blue is somewhere in that particular range. You can use this type of formula in your spreadsheets. So don't be afraid to use the checkboxes where you can choose multiple options. And then don't be afraid of long answers. I would try keep it to only one or two long answers, not more than that. But these are great when you are getting some extra information that you want people to fill out. So for example, over here, you select the paragraph 
option and that means they can type a lot of things where you can ask about suggestions where you can ask their views and then you can quote these type of answers in your phase three when you are doing your final report you can say one respondent said this about the ethical use of ai and you can comment on it so these can be quite nice but a lot of people don't always like to fill these in so i would include one or two at the end if you can but do not make them required rather set that required field off so that if they want to skip it they can they don't have to fill out a long answer if they don't want to. if they want to quickly get through your survey they can do it but if they do have the time they can write a nice long answer for you and then cat pet tip number four is the layout and the requirements you want to make sure that you get all the marks for the questionnaire so one of those in the rubric it says you must give clear instructions that guide the user so for example if we take this you can see there's a nice introduction telling them what the question is about there you can say please answer the questions in the space provided you are giving clear instructions when you've got other types of questions you can say you may select more than one option or you can select the best option or you give the rating scale make sure you are giving clear instructions don't just ask the question and let the user determine what that all means Another thing regarding the layout and the requirements, if you look over here, is that you group your questions under relevant headings. So if you look over here, I've got a section of biographical information and then a section where it talks about experience and another one that talks about opinions. Group your questions into different categories, have nice labels indicating those groupings so that you can get that mark. And then just a reminder that you must have at least five questions excluding the biographical information like where they come from and that so the actual questions about the topic there must be at least five i would suggest getting a couple more not too many more but have a couple more so you got a lot of options when you get to your spreadsheet and your database a lot of people rush that and make sure they only have five and then it's too late when you get your spreadsheet to go redo the survey because you've already got your answers. You need to make sure that you get enough information now so that you can do a proper analysis on a lot of things when we get to the spreadsheet and the database. Then don't forget about the format and the layout of your document. Make sure it's nice and professional. For example, over there, you can see how all my blocks that I can use to fill in the answers are nicely aligned and everything's laid out nice and neatly. Using headings, use your word processing skills to make sure it looks like a professional document. And then cat pat tip number five is shorten the link. Now, if you're using a Word document, you might want to email that to people for them to fill it out. But I'm assuming a lot of you are probably going to do an online form like a Google Doc. If you've got an online form, then you can also email that as well. But it's a lot easier for you then to, for example, go and share on social media or share it with friends on WhatsApp. Maybe make it your WhatsApp status in order to get people to fill it out. This is obviously depends on who your target audience is for your survey. If you've got particular people, for example, people in the medical field, then you'll want to email them specifically and find them or get someone that you know in that field that can share that information. But if it's just general, for example, students, you can share it on social media or in groups that might help you. And in order to do that, I would suggest when you go and send that form, you can then see that there is a link option that you can copy. I would make sure that you shorten that link so it's nice and short and easy to remember. That makes it a lot easier to paste into WhatsApp statuses or into emails. If you don't like that particular layout, you can also use, for example, tinyurl. That's one of my favorites where you can actually specify what your alias is going to be so you can make it a lot easier to remember. If you want to learn more about how to do this, I have a video about how to create an easier to remember website link. The link will be in the video description. It's also in the pad card. While we add it, let's talk about URL shortness. It's a good thing to learn about. Go watch this video about them because they do ask this in a theory exam about what they do and what are their benefits and things to be careful of. So go check that video out as well. And then another suggestion is that I would include that link in your Word document. Include it somewhere, just mention the online version is at this link, just so that you've got a reference to it. And that way you've shown evidence that the form was created electronically and appropriate to the way it was administered. And so you can make sure that you get that mark. And then all you have to do then is to make sure that you get that form out to at least 25 people. So I will give you some advice. I would actually target more than 25 people. And the reason for this is because the more respondents you have, the better your data. You can do a lot more statistics or find a lot more concrete evidence if you have a lot more respondents. The more respondents, the better your data is going to be. 
If you send to exactly 25 people, you've got to hope that all 25 respond and not everyone will respond. Some people will forget, some people will fill it in incorrectly and that data won't be useful to you. So rather get too many people so that out of that batch, you can at least get 25. It, remember it says that at least 25, I recommend more. So let's go through those cat pad tips quickly again. Number one, remember to create your survey in Word, plan it there first, then don't ask those questions that I mentioned, for example, the name and the surname, the age. Asking questions where you're going to get common answers. Rather focus on questions that are measurable. Focus on questions where you are going to get a date or a category. Questions that are going to help you with your calculations in your spreadsheet, in your database. And then don't forget about getting those loud and requirement marks. Make sure that you follow those instructions carefully and then shorten that link so that you can send it out, especially if you're using an online form. So there we go, everyone. I hope those tips are going to help you with your questionnaire. Remember, not only are we doing this questionnaire for our pet, but they love asking theoretical questions about the survey in your theory exam. So by experiencing this, you are going to be better prepared for those questions in your theory exam. So use this not only as a task to complete, but a learning opportunity. Good luck, and I hope you get all the information that you need. For tons of videos to help you with your cat pet, make sure that you become a subscriber to at Miss Long IT and Cat. Make sure that you share us with your friends. Make sure you follow us on TikTok as well at Miss Long Education. And by doing that, we'll make sure that you don't do it the long way, but you'll do it the Mr. Long way.